Hi everyone and welcome back to episode 5 of season 6 of the Shopstool podcast. We are joined by a very, very exciting guest today, uh, dare I say woodworking royalty. And <laughs> one of the better, or one of the more interesting points is that he's not from Melbourne after our um, <laughs> sp- spree of, of Melbourneian <laughs> woodworkers. So I'm very excited to welcome to the show, John Goulder, all the way from Adelaide. How are you this morning? I'm well, thanks for having me. We, we, are, we are very thankful that you joined the, or jumped on the show so we can have a good old chat and, and, and f- talk about your processes and your history and all of that and, and just get to hear your story. So with that in mind, I'm really interested to hear how you got to this point, where, which I would call a very successful career. Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's... Uh... I think as I grow older, I reflect more and I've been reflecting quite a bit lately on that, uh, on where it all started to where I am now. Um, I I left school at the earliest legal age in Australia, around 15. Um, My mum was a teacher and she knew I wasn't scholastic, so they got me out. (laughs) Um, My family ran a furniture manufacturing business in the southern highlands of New South Wales, so um, Mittagong, Barrel area. Um, And it was very much a family business, uh, upholstery furniture making from the ground up. And I, I grew up in that factory and just, you know... My parents didn't really want me to go to the factory um, because my it was a family business. My two uncles worked there. My dad worked there. Um, there was about 15 employees, I guess, and uh, I desperately oh. wanted to go to the factory. I, I was one of many uh, cousins or relatives that took just naturally wanted to get in the factory. So I grew up in the factory and I... Um, did my apprenticeship at the bench uh, as the boss's son, which was um, (laughs) challenging. Pretty hard, yeah. I had to work, so learnt how to work there. And, uh, yeah, it was amazing. Um, Very, My family were very proud upholsterers and my pop came down, taught me the trade. He was blind at the time. It was, yeah, pretty special, really. Country town. Wow. Mm. I like that. I like what you just said. You learnt how to work. I think that's that's a really important sentence. It's probably it, we could probably talk for a whole podcast on that sentence. If you uh, these days when you you hear the stories about kids not wanting to work, and you know you you actually do have to learn what you how to how to approach just working. You know that's an interesting. Uh, it's an interesting thing to think about. Yeah, for sure. I mean, my I've got an 18-year-old at the moment who's a second-year apprentice carpenter and I kind of found, you know, drove around town. I knew he was going to... He wanted to be a carpenter, so I drove around town for about six months and looking at crews and walking onto building sites and I found a really cool... a really good crew. But um, getting back to the point, if he, you know, he, he's expressed interest in the workshop but there's no way I'm going to teach him how to work he has to go and learn he has to go and learn that (laughs) part from uh, another bunch of people Mm. um, which he's doing so he'll know how to work by the end of his apprenticeship (laughs) then he might be able to come to the workshop yeah Yeah. right it's chatting about the workshop is it it's a commercial space in Adelaide is it on the yeah, in the suburbs or no? Nah, it's right in the CBD. Um, it's on the other side of town from the Jam Factory, um, which is a pretty cool developing side of town in Adelaide, actually. Uh, and Adelaide's one of the few cities in Australia where you can actually have two hundred square um, right in the city, and uh, it's it's kind of affordable. Yeah. Um, or it was when we took this lease. So I pop, I cohabitated a space with uh, Snowheader Architects um, and their start-up in Australia was also at the Jam Factory. Uh, they rented a space there and we became friends and 
um, with Cora, the 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 boss of Austra- Australasia. So we cohabitated a building. Um, How did you find co- cohabiting a space with an architect in terms of um, noise and volume and work hours and all those kind of things? Oh, uh, yeah. They, I mean, I, I, well, I built it. Uh, I built the purpose-built studio and soundproofed it. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I kind of went uh-huh. overboard. So all the three-phase power is through the walls, all the, all the air is, uh, is through the walls. I, I, it's a purpose-built uh, one-man dream <laughs> studio, really. <laughs> Line the ceilings with ply. And, yeah. And a lot of our listeners would be makers as well as designers, but um, Snowetta are Norwegian-based architects originally, right? Yeah. Are they Norwegian or something? Yeah. Scandinavian? And you ended up as a lead designer senior, for the No, a senior designer, uh, one, senior of, designer. one of many, a, a part of a, a small cog in a big machine. Um, yeah, yeah, it's been amazing when, you, when I think about uh, the trajectory from 15-year-old at a bench learning a trade in the family business to senior designer at Snowheader. It's quite a leap. And, um, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Don't think about it too much. <laughs> you, just, you just go with it. <laughs> I think I'll come full circle. Yeah. <laughs> well, what, was the type, what was the type of work you were doing with them, John? Was it mainly interiors or a bit of, um, bit of everything? Oh, I played a big, I've played a big role in designing some facades for, for skyscrapers, like big, big projects, um, general interior art and architectural um, input. Uh, um, I'm really interested in quite large scale design strategy on on uh, for interiors, actually. But um, I'm also really acutely aware of the fact that I need to. I've got a certain amount of out. I, I need to get a lot more work out than I'm. Uh, Hence my Melbourne Design Week um, presentation. I, right. I I think I just need to make, 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 and I I don't necessarily get fed that um, amount of work through the architecture studio. You're a you're a very um, you're you know you're a cog in a machine, which is great. I, lo- I love the interaction. I mean, uh, you know, workshops can be quite solitude, as we've said. Um, or there is a yeah. So I love the interaction with with people and being a part of a team, but I do feel I need to um, get a lot more work out. I, I've got a lot in my mind I want to make. So, yeah. How do, so how do you make that switch mentally? For me, it's difficult working, doing a couple of drawings and working, walking three metres, I'm in the workshop and now I've got to cut some wood. But then you're being hired to sit at a desk, presumably, and design... And at the same time, you're in your head designing what you actually want to be doing. And, and how do you make that transition from designer for a week and then give yourself three days to make? Very difficult. Yeah, it's... Um, I'm very, very... I've always been incredibly selfish in, in what I make and how I make it. I, I kind of, you know... In my various roles, Jam Factory, for example, I was I, I taught from the bench, and as a working example, I'm, um, I get that from George. That's how George Ingham taught us at Canberra School of Art. Um, I, I kind of am a disciple of George Ingham. Um, so, in an architecture studio scenario, yes, I do have to kind of I have had to play that senior designer role and. and and be a part of the team and be at the desk and, it, yeah, it's very difficult. And what I mean by selfish is I guess I portion packages of work off. It might be six months or a year where I really hit something hard and in that time right. it's very um, – I'm very distracted one way or the other. So, I, right. yeah, I kind of um, – yeah, I was thinking about it earlier, you know, I, I have focused on Snowheader work for about the last three or four years um, and haven't been making a great deal of work after that Broach Commission's exhibition um, and COVID and, you know, the whole 
weirdness. So it's been great to work as a senior designer for Snowheader in that time. Um, amazing experience. I feel incredibly fortunate. But I, at the moment I'm pretty driven to... I've got a lot of stuff in my mind that I want to make. It seems to come in waves. It's not a constant, you know. And when the wave comes, I know I'm going to dig in. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. For all your talk of not producing that much, or at least lately, um, you seem to be pretty prolific in what you've designed and produced. Um, and I'm not entirely sure if everything I've seen is you personally making it or if you've designed it and someone else has made it. I, I suspect a bit of both. No, um, I make it. I'm the only, yeah. I, I'm, okay. I'm it. Yeah, I don't. I, I mean, so, I, I use industry for laser cutting and stuff, but yeah, yeah. no, I, I'm I'm it. I'm a one man band. Um, yeah, always have been. I, Luca, I've, I worked with Luca Letteri for uh, about three years, but that was pre COVID. Um, that was jam fa- around jam factory times. Um, but yeah, no, I'm it. So I'm interested. And we have talked about intellectual property uh, quite a bit and, and about designs being thefted. Um, and I, it just struck me, I was looking through your website and it struck me that you have all these models of your pieces of furniture. Like I could just download a SketchUp model of one of your pieces. So what, what's your um, thought process there? Oh, it's for specifiers, architects. But having worked, I guess, having worked in the archi- in an architecture studio, I've been in here for six years. I just understand, and and I've got you know really good friends like Ross Gardam and um, in design world, and I. So I get to. I've always been. I've always had one eye or one foot in each camp, really from between craft and design. So I'm very fortunate to have, have, have some really good friends, Alexander Lodestein, a designer, and Ross Gardam, and that, it's kind of what they do, you know. They just make their models available mm. to be... to populate um, Revit models in, or in right. interior design or, or architecture to, to increase your chances of being specified. Um, into a larger scale project it's it's all new for me actually i i mean the website has just been is just finished after six months of work Mm. um it's been huge getting that website together yeah Uh it looks good (laughs) yeah i suppose it's it's similar to what we always say joey about when you put an image out online like that's out online for everybody to see and if somebody wants to knock it off good luck to them but yeah. if somebody downloads that model and then tries to make one of John's pieces, it's not one of John's pieces because he hasn't made it. Yeah. So there's all that value, yeah, yeah. and like it doesn't cost it doesn't cost him a client or whoever a client because that person would never have been in his client base. Mm, that's a good yeah, look at it. It's just the, the joys of working in the 21st century, I suppose. Yeah, I kind of another have a strong influence on on me and you know people who were in Canberra around that time as Rob Foster and uh, of Fink Design and he's a was a, a famous uh, metalsmith and he just taught us to own the technology and to own the process and then you can't get ripped off anyway. Like a lot yep. of the things I do, if someone's stupid enough to bloody want to carve a <laughs> back on a chaise lounge like that or yeah. Um, <laughs> press yeah, a, right. bit a bit of DIY leather wa- water forming or something. Yeah, make the mold and try <laughs> like go for it. I, 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 yeah, I um, that's yeah, that's another a strong influence. Rob Foster owned the process. You know, no one yep. um, could really rip him off, and I guess that's what I'm doing. I think that's I think that's how craft evolves as well. I'm. George, you know, my other massive influence is George Ingham, who taught us to be to never go over the same ground twice. To kind of, you know, a lot of people who were trained by George Kurt think it call it the Canberra School of Art curse because you just never 
you just constantly searching and, and or, or, or trying to better your craft your craft skill and you live poor basically as a result <laughs> because you never mm. because it's it's very hard to make money from those pursuits you know those um, but we were brainwashed for sure George Ingham's I'm a I'm a product of George Ingham. At what stage in your career did you, so you did your internship in the family business and then you went to Canberra School of Art or was there a gap in between? Or? Yeah, there was about 10 years of kind of partying around the world with all my mates and um, doing whatever, just classic, uh, classic, you know, Gen X, Aussie. Yep. Um, yeah, I think we all made a pact that we wouldn't get serious about anything until we were in our 30s and... Uh, yeah, so I went to Canberra School of Art when the party stopped and uh, that was at about, I think I was 30, 20, 29, 30. Um, so, yeah, I finished my apprenticeship. Uh, I realised eight hours at a bench, five days a week, upholstering was going to drive, I would go mad for all the, you know, the irrelevant or thoughts that you have when something becomes automatic tacit knowledge um then i built i just did anything i built houses whatever to earn enough money to buy the next plane ticket or to go on the next adventure uh yeah surfing skateboarding and snowboarding basically (laughs) (laughs) partying (laughs) And then went to Canberra, yeah. And uh, yeah, it was a good time to go at that age with a bit, you know, a wise, wiser head on my shoulders maybe. Speaking of wise heads on shoulders, one of the things I no- looked at on your Instagram profile was your recent business card. I use the term business card very loosely in this circumstance because of what it is. Um, we were talking to someone not too long ago about business cards. Oh, actually, no, it was you, Brian, about your QR code and, yeah, and all of that. Yeah, so yeah. for all the listeners who haven't seen on, on John's profile, he's got a spinning top. Um, and that is the, the, the business card for it. It was a, something, an event in Melbourne. Is that, that right? It was the event in Melbourne. Yeah. Melbourne design, Melbourne design. Yeah, right. yeah. 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 Um, how, I, I can't see in the picture, but how much detail do you actually have on the, the top itself? Because it's quite a small top, I'm guessing. Yeah, it it's a, it's a, it's fits beautifully in your hand. Um, yeah, and Andy Carwell turned them. I mean, Andrew and I amuse on many things. I'm very lucky to have Andrew across the way or, you know, in, his, in, mix, in the Mixed Goods studio. So Andrew helped me turn them and, you know, we developed these ideas over coffees and um <laughs> i imagine they don't fit in your pocket so well though <laughs> <laughs> not your back pocket anyway no nah, they you can't carry a bunch they of just <laughs> yeah no they're a nice size to carry around um yeah it's just it's a lovely it's a lovely idea like getting away from the sort of disposable nature of here's a card here's a card yeah really like it so you brought a good few of those to Melbourne Design Week, didn't you? Yeah, I did. And a- Andrew came up with the idea of... Because we had different timbers, and I I would never think of stuff like this, but Andrew was kind of saying, you can't, you know, you've got to put them out on the table and whoever you give one to, because I only had 30, 40, um, you've got to get them to pick which wood they like. <laughs> and so... Right. It became a whole kind of... I got my bots, carried it over, put them on the table, and, you know, to people who I knew might specify or buy my work. Um, yep. Yeah, a bit of and then they chose, and it became this whole thing. It was really special. Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And now, now I'm... I'm surprised. Sorry, now I'm scambling to post pictures as much as I can so I can claim that <laughs> idea. So I, <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I came up with it. It's mine. Um, I was just. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say uh, it surprised me that you said you make everything. Um, well, it doesn't surprise me, but I, I imagined in my head that you had a, a bigger team behind you, perhaps. Um, because when I look at some of the pieces 
you've made, I'm like, oh yeah, that has to be made by some giant factory because, well, it's bloody hard. For example, I'm looking at your pavilion chair, which is like, I don't know if it's offensive to say, but I imagine it's roughly based on some kind of bent plywood Scandinavian style stuff. Um, that's what comes to mind. But bending plywood in big sheets like that is not easy. In fact, typically you have to laminate it on over a big giant mold. And, and did you make then these giant molds to make your own plywood? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm an expert mold <laughs> maker. I get on the... Like even for the chair that I just did it, I carved that mould by hand. Um, yeah, I just... <laughs> it's kind of like I can... I'll get back to the pavilion chair. It's actually leather, so I'm, it's kind of developing oh. a new new process. As that was for festival theatre at the Jam Factory originally. Okay, I see it now. Leather, it makes more sense. Yeah, okay. I love... Well, you know, I've done so much plywood, and so leather, I love the fact that it's a one-shot process. There's no... I don't have to finish that. I don't have to sand it. I don't have to worry right. about going through the veneer. I don't have to... I just am so over... <laughs> going through veneers, um, laminating yeah. shit, and uh, I, I uh, so leather's nice because I can kind of press it, cut it, done, and I. So, there's, mm. so, so sorry, John. There's no substrate at all in that no. in any of the. Ah, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm kind of just. I'm really interested in in that case. It's about folding the leather to to get extruded forms that are self supportive almost. In, in the yeah. bin mm. and then right. the other ones like the, the settler's chair the dining chair and the console is all about trying to create self-supporting structures through compound curve and and mm. then the surface tension between laminated compound curves is really quite incredibly strong and, and is that l- is it laminated leather? Yeah. Or is it really thick somehow? No, laminated leather in a, vac- okay, in a vacuum press, which is Whoa. getting back to the Rob Foster thing. It's the, a process that I know nobody is doing, so I'm kind of... <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah, trying to develop or develop new processes and, and techniques for, for um, furniture. That's awesome. That's so a, constantly making life difficult. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the curse. <laughs> it's yeah. the Georgingham curse. You can't go over the same ground twice. You have. It's like <clears throat> he was. Um, he. He. Uh, I say. I, I mean, curse affectionately. You know, George is my mentor. Very much a, a master in many ways. Um, yeah, you can't. You need to be designing the next piece when you're halfway through the one you're on, and you can never go over the same yeah. ground. It, it was a Zen thing, you know. George was into this constant progression, and craft was the vehicle for that progression in your life and in your mind. And you know, it, uh, craft is the vehicle. It's how you kind of minute how you work with that vehicle and, and, and what you produce needs to demonstrate a, a level of and so yeah I very much drank that Kool-Aid <laughs> at Canberra School of Art yeah yeah I was incredibly fortunate we had David up, Phil Brown, George Ingham Michael Gill Ian Guthridge yeah the dream team for two, two three years of just constant uh, working, yeah, George. Yeah, yeah, he chose. I think he chose five a year, six a year, maybe. Yeah, and it was hardcore. If you you didn't dare arrive late. And <laughs> <laughs> mm. um, when you talk about like investing so much in the process, do you see this as being actually? And I know, like time wise and financially like there's other ways that you could be more successful in the very commas but um do you not think that this is potentially the actual future of sustaining making in australia 
is by doing this with all machine learning and AI and technology and things like that to actually invest the time in the process and the thought and putting that into your work. Obviously, it's, it, it squeezes your target market massively into a niche. But when I, when I look at art and design, like I see that as being a sustain, sorry, sustainable option and not the churn of, you know, I'm going to make 50 of these pieces a year because they bring in X amount of money. I don't know. Do you feel the same way? Yeah. Did you was did you originally say in that question uh, this is a, a more sustainable way or? Yeah. Well, if you're talking about the actual like trying to keep craft going like for the next hundred years and get people to invest money in pieces, do you think they're going to invest more in the idea that you have spent you know a lifetime on process? And ideas making as opposed to just the aesthetic of the piece looks this way and I'm just going to get them out. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, not, I'm not sure. At, I, I hope that people invest. Yeah, I hope. I mean, yeah, it's interesting. I just think uh, as craftspeople we need to be involved in the progression of the craft and not and and then that becomes mm. a saleable a more saleable thing it needs to be relevant but I, I think through development and and mad scientist kind of explorations in craft um, we progress the craft therefore it it remains relevant to the time and so I think Craftspeople need to play a role in that. Like, a, you know, you can see it through ceramics and glass and everyone's constantly pushing and I, I feel like uh, I need to be a part of that for my craft and um, mm. whether that... I hope that that leads to sales. I think what leads to sales is identifiable aesthetic. I, I, I keep thinking Kai Lu, um, mm-hmm. you know, what a, what a identify. He had an incredibly, I, or has an incredibly identifiable aesthetic. Um, I know he's not a hardcore crafty like um, many of us. He had a team of makers, but I think that identifiable aesthetic and process kind of sold his work at a really high price, and it's very hard to attain that. Um, I would have to say I haven't attained that. People don't... uh, Where I've shot myself in the foot as a craft practitioner is I have... (laughs) uh, I doggedly go at things to to develop the next piece and forget to market the piece that I've just finished because I'm right. on to the next thing. So, I mean, for example, Melbourne Design Week this year, I took a glissando credenza, which is 15 years ago, and, a, and that pavilion chair and sat them in the space and most people hadn't ever seen them. Um, yeah, this is this is something that's been like the constant desire to do new work is what fulfills us, but it doesn't make your old work bad. Like, mm. and there's so many eyes that have never been. It's something that I just I did an exhibition mm. over the last two weeks, and I brought old pieces, like 15 year old pieces, and the same thing I found John, and I was able to take pride out of them again, as opposed to going, I've got to do the next thing, I've got to do the next thing. I don't know how much of that is driven by just I don't know. The, the age that we live in or social media or something like that. But the entrepreneurial it, spirit. Yeah, a little bit of that, but I find it really refreshing to actually reconnect with my old work, was I'm, I'm sure you did at, at Design Week. Yeah, absolutely. It's cool. It's, uh, we should celebrate it, I think. Yeah. Uh, crafties, we just keep... I think we all are just in pursuit of this... Yeah. Which is great. I mean, what a blessing. How it's the most, it's got to be the coolest thing, you know. I'm so blessed to be so driven by the pursuit of this material. Yeah, how cool. <laughs> so I, from what I understand, you, um, 
obviously I think like you just said, all of us are trying to always be thinking of the next thing and our gears always churning. And so does it actually annoy you when somebody comes and says, Oh yeah, I want to buy one of those. Thanks. And now you, do you stop what you're doing and go, God, now I've got to, yeah. got to go back and remember how to make that thing. And what did I do last time? But actually my head's still in this current thing. Cause I want to get to that point where you're like satisfied. Like, is that annoying actually having customers at a point? Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, that's what I mean by selfish. I'm incredibly selfish yeah. in what I make. I'm right. like, oh, God. Yeah, no, I don't want to do it again. Um, yeah, that's what I hate doing something twice. I, I can't stand it. And I would, I, I've never wanted to have a range of things because I don't want to remember how to do that thing mm. again. See, I'm wrangling uh, myself. At the moment, I'm in the, I'm in the, um, I'm becoming my dad, who was a, you know, <laughs> ran the business and hired apprentices and, uh, yeah, no, I'm, um, I'm wrangling myself to sell my shit. Finally, mm. it's like, come on, like I, I need to, it needs to live in the world. I, um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at at the moment, and, and that's ta- taken quite a bit of wrangling. Hence the website, hence the, hence right. this push at the moment into Melbourne Design Week and, you know, I'm trying to uh, get serious about producing some work. You Are might... you typically um, servicing Australian customers or is it a lot of overseas things happening? Or... Uh, a bit of both. Main, mostly Australian, yeah. Not, I haven't ever... That's cool. I'm, I've never had a huge international presence um that again i mean it just it's just such a massive effort um i've never really had the money i'm i we live uh like yeah uh you know we live in a shack on the beach it's it's a (laughs) my boys share a room and they're 18 and 16 (laughs) so uh we certainly don't have um a home entertainment kind of cinema or anything like that um yeah right. no, i mean uh yeah yeah i'm sorry i forgot classic artists pretty much yeah. just straight up artists pretty when, much um, <laughs> it's, we've i've told the story before but uh before joey and i were on this podcast together the i remember just going through joey's stuff and he had this resource there was a little booklet that I think you said, Joey, you essentially put together for people that ask the same questions over and over again. Here's the, here's the reason. Yeah. And the line that stuck with me is, is if you become a, a full-time woodworker you, or, or designer, you will not be rich. That is just, <laughs> that is just something you need to <laughs> internalize and then move on with it. Yeah. There's, there are some very successful models in Australia, you know, for design who... Who, um, who uh, they're very successful at uh, um, producing in industry, in Australian industry through to the market. Yeah, Ross Gardam, Alexander Lottestein, Goodrum, um, you know, there's some amazing examples uh, who designers have done incredibly well. Not crafts people. Um, <laughs> yeah. For- designers, they're, they're 100% yeah. industrial mm. designers. Mm. Yeah. And then at the other end, you've kind of got the Arthur Seigneurs and things like that doing marketry, which is, you know, collected around the world and yeah. able to charge whatever whatever they want for it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's true. Yeah, no, there's some very, there's some, some great success stories in Australia. So I'm kind of, yeah, I can, uh, I can, uh, as I've said, I've always had a foot in each in the craft and design. So I've got a, quite an intimate view into um, both worlds, which I'm, yeah, it's always kind of been an interest of mine just to understand how people do it and how they're doing it. And, uh, but for me, I just, um, I just need to be in a workshop and I need to be constantly making. That's my... Do you, do you miss any, any aspect of teaching? Good question. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I've always enjoyed giving back. I, 
I've thought about this a lot. I mean, I've done alongside all of that. I've 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 worked for not for profit arts craft organisations for uh, you know fourteen years. Um, form contemporary craft and design in Perth for seven years and Jam Factory for five, and then universities and stuff like that. Um, I, I, my way of teaching, I think, you know, is from the bench. It's I have really high expectations of anyone who's in my workshop. I don't, you know, I teach like George Ingham taught, and I'm not sure that's um, in this day and age that hardcore kind of old school uh, apprentice. Uh, is not so accepted. <laughs> I offend people, you know. I don't like people. If, if you're in my workshop and I'm going to give you all my knowledge and connect you with all of my industry and exhibition opportunities, there's blueprints for how to do it, I kind of expect that you'd turn up on time or you'd, you know, mm-hmm. I'm... It's not for tire kickers. You want to be there. You want to learn, and you and you get down and do it. That's right. right. It's not just yeah, but so thinking about do I want to be here? So my de- I, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, when the new generations change, when when the, there was a generational shift, and and you had to kind of uh, you know. Um, way up or you had to uh, embrace so many different, um, yeah, I'm too old school to teach. (laughs) (laughs) I've got my expectations. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, for my son who's 18 on a building site, being a carpenter, it's, there's, he, if you don't work, you get sacked, see you later. Um, If you're late, you you get shit put on you all day. Um, he comes home completely worked, you know. I know he's had a big day on site. Um, so there's... Uh, I've got a... Tr- I'm a tradie, you know. I think that's where it, what it boils down to. I am um, pretty uh, to the core tradie and uh, all my mates are tradies. And, um, yeah, so that's how I roll and I think- that's hard in uh, government institutions at times. I think you're a rare bridge between that classic tradie, Kiwi or Aussie, and yet you're still able to step into the shoes of a designer who, if you look at it from the tradie's point of view, is thought of with some kind of disdain and they don't know what they're doing sitting in the office drawing pretty pictures and we're out here digging holes, you know, but you're like crossing both you're both at the same time and it's an interesting it's a, juxtaposition it's a complete contradiction <laughs> it <Yes>. always has <laughs> been people don't quite know how to yeah <laughs> I feel if, it, it feels a very Australian thing like I don't know of that that exists many other places yeah I think you either have yeah. the craft world and the, and the art world and the trade world and they all kind of exist in their sort of three different pockets but I've as an immigrant to Australia that's what I feel sums up totally. a really good aspect of Australian society that that can still exist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. And uh, I mean, uh, my, uh, I think to a degree it's a little bit generational. I mean, we just were, we were brought up by Peter Garrett and uh, Midnight Oil and what he was preaching to us and we, we bought that as well, you know, like... <laughs> Uh, the lyrics of his songs we just we know we we live in the luckiest country in the world I I went to Canberra School of Art on our study as a mature age you know it's how good do you want it this is so that's why I'm happy to live poor on the beach because it's uh, this is just playground and uh, you know you can exhibit work you can make things happen you can run a pot you can do a podcast like you guys like it's just um if you've got the energy to put it to give to it then go for it that's yeah. what i've i've just had the energy i, I love I'm very lucky i love what i do and that is a fantastic 
beautiful note to end off the show. I think that's the most positive end we've ever had to a show. That's great. And that's why. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> Thanks, John. Let's call it there. And let's, let's end <laughs> yeah. on that. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, John. Great to meet you guys. Anything I can do to help or promote or just, yeah, give us a yell. It'd be great to meet and have lunch or something sometime in Melbourne. Absolutely. Sounds good. If we ever done in Adelaide, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come down to Adelaide. We'll give you the royal royal tour. We'll go on a workshop um, (laughs) tour. Andrew, we'll get Andy involved. He'll be keen. There's a lot of, good. lot of really cool workshops in, in Adelaide. Yeah. Cool. Mm. All right. Great. Thank, All right. Thanks again, John. John, take care. All the best. And we will probably talk to you soon. Great. Thanks. Bye. See you, See you everyone. Cheers.